Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Automotive Supply Chain Collaboration and the Technology Challenges Ahead, brought to you by Polarian Software. Your first speaker today will be Mike Boris, one of our Polarian Software Product Managers. You will also be hearing from Clara Shizmaru. Now, let's begin. To start our webinar, I present Mike Boris. Okay, thanks, Gerard. Actually, I consider myself uh, one of the luckier product managers here since one of my areas of responsibility is the automotive industry vertical. And by lucky, I mean that, well, I like cars. And uh, also because the automotive industry as a whole is in the midst of a tremendous techn technological revolution. As a product manager, I guess that makes me lucky because of all of the sudden interest about the software within automobiles and, of course, the spillover of interest about software development for vehicles. By various estimates, there are about 1.2 billion motor vehicles on the planet. And so there are few, really, few other manufactured goods that daily touch more lives. So today we're going to talk broadly about supply chains, which have become a critical part in manufacturing all of these motor vehicles. Naturally, the topic supply chains is an extremely broad subject. You could literally spend a lot of money and, and time studying supply chains in university classrooms. And when you were finished with all of that, you would probably know only enough to just barely begin to understand the real world applications and the dynamics of automotive supply chains. So obviously in this short time we have together today, we're not going to explore the topic very deeply, but at the same time, we should be able to share some perspectives in more or less an overview approach to discuss certain critical aspects to consider when looking at solutions to manage the complexity of what is both uh, an organizational and an engineering problem domain. As I mentioned, automotive technology is very much in the news almost daily. Unfortunately, it's mostly bad headlines. So these are indeed both revolutionary times as well as tumultuous times for the whole automotive sector. Now, obviously, some of this bad news is having a profound effect on automaker reputations, on venerable brand names, on, on entire technologies, and, of course, on careers as well. This turmoil is still unfolding, and the full impact of all that's occurred in the last couple of weeks remains unknown. The only reason I mention this is because it provides a somewhat fitting backdrop because certainly one of the areas of interest in today's topic concerns resiliency. In other words, one measurement of supply chain effectiveness is how well such an organizational system is able to respond and, and adapt to unexpected changes. So let's at least scratch the surface to gain some rudimentary understanding and perhaps a shared common respect for some important forces that shape automotive supply chains. So the automotive sector is forever in a perpetual state of transformation. The value chain for automakers essentially transforms basic materials into a finished vehicle product that lands in a distribution chain, a dealer showroom. Originally and historically, this value chain was realized through a vertical integration. In, in a vertical integration approach, a company owns and directly manages all or most of the assets of production. Provide, this provides the ultimate in control by, by ensuring supply, quality, and price of all of the component parts and in, in sub-assemblies and constituents. For a long time, it was a, an effective way to also maximize profit since each segment had a predictable and dependable stream of orders from the next segment. And as a result, the company could show an economic profit at every step. So this was the, the prevalent approach of automakers Henry Ford was perhaps the poster child for this approach, at least in the U.S. automotive industry. Ford could literally bring iron ore, sand, and other basic materials into one end of the factory and out the other end rolled new cars. Many, if not most, firms that produced consumer goods implemented this strategy because it was really thought to reduce risk and increase returns. Now, a shift away from vertical integration began in large part because the products demanded by consumers 
became differentiated. As automakers realized the way to grow their revenue was to cater to customer demand, they started to produce different models rather than a single standard model. And as differences increased, production runs became shorter, changeover and setup costs increased, scheduling was more complex, inventories increased, and, and the number of decisions that had to be made drew dramatic, dramatically. Manufacturers found it profitable then to outsource certain components such that suppliers would be able to cope with the, the complexity. And suppliers found that as they acquired expertise, they could achieve economies of scale and they had a greater they, they also had a greater means to lower labor costs because they weren't burdened by the same personnel issues that automakers are. And so the supply chain became somewhat globalized. Thus we have a present day symbiotic relationship between OEMs and their supply chains. Supply chains in most situations are enormous. Hundreds of companies making thousands of parts and components ultimately funneled into a final into a set of final assembly points via complex logistics. And since this chain is global, parts and components with high labor content are usually sourced from lower wage countries. And this introduces a logistics and shipping as a significant factor in a supply chain as well as considerations for cost. So this is an incredibly complex, requiring automotive companies to really organize their supply chains in ways that can be effectively managed. The correct high-quality parts and components, they've, they've got to arrive at the right time, in the right quantity, in a coordinated manner, such that vehicle assembly can be ongoing, is not interrupted, and can be done, can be done quickly and efficiently. Now, additionally, more and more vehicles now must include advanced electronic capabilities, GPS, infotainment systems, sophisticated safety f systems, advanced uh, driver assistance systems. All that stuff needs a, a lot of different component pieces and parts, everything from rear view cameras and collision sensors to you name it. So these are the newest elements to be added to the supply mix. They are also likely some of the most uh, complex elements in the finished vehicle, and so they present a whole new set of considerations beyond the, the purely mechanical. So competition in the automotive sector is really no longer company versus company. Rather, the competition is supply chain versus supply chain. So production, delivery, these are all team efforts. And to achieve any manner of market success, the lead company must be able to design, organize, and execute supply chain activities. Now, this doesn't mean ownership or even direct control, but it does imply actions and mechanisms that influence decision making and impact performance. Supply chains obviously are not, there's not one size fits all for all situations as far as a supply chain. The relationships between supply chain participants uh, vary widely and really depend upon what's needed, what's needed in the marketplace, not by what's needed in the next stage, downstream or upstream in a supply network. The, the elements of a supply chain can be common to different suppliers, different brands, and even different automakers. So what that means is different automakers may leverage a common component that can also be used potentially by, by competitors. The consumer is really, the, the purchasing customer is really seeking the best value from a supply chain. Whether they, whether they know it or not, they're exercising a system-wide evaluation rather than a car-specific or company evaluation when they, make their, when they make their choices to buy one car or another. So when customers buy a vehicle product, they're actually choosing the output of an entire supply chain. When the purchase is completed, all of the corresponding supply chain participants are, that's when they're effectively paid. Businesses in a supply chain uh, may be directly concerned about inner workings of the chain itself, such as which firm holds inventory or which company absorbs the cost. In consumers, they're not directly concerned about who holds inventory, who bears costs, how the supply chain works, but they do to but they they do care when things like total inventory and total cost in a supply chain become too high because this will have a tendency to drive the vehicle prices higher. So 
customers thus have a huge, albeit indirect, influence on the dynamics of a of a supply chain. So this shift to supply chains was really accelerated when automakers realized they could no longer afford the cost of managing and controlling a completely vertical organization. So one of the one of the aspects is concerns agility. So agility is is quite difficult within a hierarch- hierarchical structure where every decision is percolated upward until a person with enough authority is found to make a decision. This is this is obviously costly and it creates delays as cars and trucks become more complex and variety increases. A hierarchy often exhibits an inability to make good decisions to make good decisions quickly and in some cases to make any decision. So a shift to outsourcing and supply chain management really allow, has allowed automakers to replace command and control with more market driven market drivers that are based upon consumer wants, overall competition, and shared benefits. This in turn drives the actions of their suppliers towards outcomes that benefit the entire supply chain. Okay, so there are at least four broad ways to classify supply chain relationships. So you have strategic partners. These are these are the ones that collaborate closely on product design and development. They're often producing or introducing new technologies into vehicles that provide market differentiation. They might be related to safety, convenience, or performance. They require a, a high level of interaction between supplier and OEM. They usually involve high-cost products. It often means that, obviously, inventories are kept low. These products are delivered just in time, and there's probably a great deal of product variability as well. Now, operating partners work closely also with OEMs in production, but not so closely on product design or in, in ideation. They, they are working hard to take cost out by improving quality, improving productivity, eliminating no-value or low-value steps, Things like sequence delivery, providing components in a precise order, um, quality and safety still uh, cannot be compromised. Operating partnerships often provide um, larger parts and sub-assemblies, things like uh, passenger seats that are extremely costly to inventory. Then you have an arm's length relationship. These tend to be standard products that are often not dent- differentiated. That is to say they have little influence uh, as customer incentives, but they're still expected to be highly reliable and and to perform per specification. So these are things like, uh, these are things that are not really seen by the consumer, things like pumps and servo motors and alternators and hoses. These are all essential products where costs and quality are critically important, but where Product differentiation is probably unimportant to the buyer. Here, the the supplier OEM relationship is usually well, it's it's somewhat more limited. Nevertheless, it's specification intensive because deliverables must function as expected. They they must deliver needed power. They must be physically compatible with other components. They must fit into whatever designated compartments that uh, they're intended for. And lastly, you have sort of an open market set of participants. These tend to be things that are more commodities, things like uh, lubricants and oils that really have, uh, you know, they're more or less things you could acquire over the internet for all intents and purposes. So customer wants are translated to suppliers through a, a series of design decisions. And these decisions essentially shape the parts and components that are then produced throughout the supply chain. Sometimes the the driving force for this is innovation. Other times it's based upon manufacturing costs and and productivity. They they wind up being the determining considerations. In other cases, it's based upon transportation, logistics, and inventory costs that define the relationship between the OEM and and a supplier. So Really, a supply chain is more than just an outsourced manufacturing and distribution network that's moving parts and components to an assembly line. It's really a really complex web of relationships. Essentially, it's a, it's a design ecosystem. 
it, that's globally spread across dozens, even hundreds of companies in what's come to be known as, as relationship tiers. So this tiered view is typically just an accepted way of mapping a supply chain for purposes of understanding or reference. It's, it's really quite an artificial mapping of a relationship hierarchy or uh, in some cases it's an implied economic driven separation of the relationships sort of a uh, one man ceiling is another man's floor view of the world but tiers can also be based upon any number of factors some of which may have absolutely nothing to do with engineering so at the top the original equipment manufacturers the OEMs they bear the final responsibility for quality and safety and they they have all of the attendant accountability and liability obligations so OEMs may be the tip of the spear in this sort of pyramid view of a of an automotive supply chain but conversely they're also a jumping off point in another supply chain that uh, delivers products to a distribution network so in this particular view that we're considering here you have the OEMs at the top and then you have a tier 1 which are the direct suppliers to the OEMs this tier is especially common in automotive uh, sector to refer to their major suppliers so uh, an example might be Sensata Technologies that's a tier 1 supplier of exhaust gas sensors or any sensors tier 2 are the suppliers to tier one without supplying a product directly to the OEM companies typically so uh, in this sort of view of the world a single company may be a tier one maybe a tier one supplier to one company and a tier two supplier to another company or maybe a tier one supplier for one product and a tier two supplier for a different set of products so now that we have some minimal sort of perspective as what supply chains look like and some of the dynamics let's look now at some of the challenges that are faced in a complex uh, automotive supply chain there, there are many challenges and often they're they're quite situational in nature but we can at least uh, touch upon some of the major areas and some of the recent tra trends that are proving to be problematic so in supply chains the flow of information is at least as important if not more important than the flow of parts and materials or whatever the deliverables are from a supplier so information and data must be able to cascade to the to all of the tiers in the chain the tiers below and, and it must be able to swim information must be able to go upstream to the tiers above at the same time there is a hierarchy to the information and data that are exchanged as well as a hierarchy in the in the weight I guess of collaborative styles for example a collaboration between an OEM and the suppliers in all of the tiers is sometimes needed other times it's absolutely required or you may have situations where collaboration between a tier 1 supplier and its corresponding tier 2 suppliers may not need to involve the OEM uh, for whom they're both working other times OEM involvement in inter-tier interaction is is vitally critical rarely as in as in never <laughs> are the the tool sets the systems used within the supply chain rarely are those all of those tools that are used by different participants rarely are they homogeneous systems all of the all of the forces that make supply chain make the supply chain uh, approach compelling virtually guarantee a landscape of widely disparate tool sets so one of the key challenges if not the biggest challenge is to find ways of harmonizing all of these information flows and in the process to establish a unified supply community that's essentially aligned with respect to purpose and roles and expectations and deliverables so Similarly, as the supply chain elongates, uh, as the supply chain elongates, well, the planet shrinks. And by that I mean, again, all of the forces that make a supply chain approach compelling, that virtually guarantees the supply chain participants will be, will be globalized. 
So you have some fundamental issues of access and language and all all of these will be considerations for collaboration. In fact, even the word collaboration by itself is a, is a very broad term that really should be broken down. It can mean it can mean everything from informal mechanisms to facilitate ideas, things like uh, wikis and voting and comments. It, it can also mean things like critical event notifications. It can also mean things like formal acceptance and approval, which have to be evidenced. So a really contextualized communication is required. The right persons really need to see the right information, and they need to see it at the right time. Simply letting everybody in the supply chain see everything all the time and hoping they'll be able to accurately interpret and figure out significance, that really impedes efficiency, or at worst, it creates defects because either something was missed or something was misinterpreted. So supply chain visibility and oversight are tremendous challenges, significantly significantly during the resolution of any issues, in which case, so traceability becomes vital throughout the entire supply chain. If something went wrong, determining how did it happen? Or more often, we thought something was wrong, but it turns out it was correct based upon what was specified. Or uh, even more interesting, we need to make some kind of change, some sort of fundamental, even subtle engineering change. What that, what's that going to mean to the supply chain? What's, that, what's, the, what's the impact? So w- worth mentioning is, is, a value, is, a, is an interesting technique called value analysis. So this, this involves a rigorous joint examination by, of each step in a supply chain, both the design and the production process. Basically, you're asking the question, is every step necessary? Can it be done more cheaply? So here, an example might be, in engineering, it's, it's often prevalent that you go back to a prior version of something similar as a starting point to begin the design of some needed new thing. In this sort of landscape of informational flow, rarely is Rarely are the tool sets used by all of the participants in the supply chain. Rarely are those a homogenous set of tools. So basically, all of the systems that are used in the supply chain tend to be um, they, they, all of the things that make a supply chain compelling will tend to virtually guarantee that all of the tools used in the supply chain are going to be different. So you're going to have this uh, landscape of very separate tools. And one of the fundamental challenges is to find ways of of harmonizing this information flow that needs to occur within the supply chain. So that that's the way to effectively establish a a unified uh, community approach and enable uh, collaboration. So supply chain visibility and oversight these are these are tremendous challenges. Typically, that, that comes out in the resolution of issues, in which cases traceability becomes extremely vital. So if something goes wrong, you have to figure out how it happened. If something, in some cases, you thought there was something wrong, but it turns out it was correct based upon what was specified. So I think uh, worth mentioning here is something called value analysis. This is a rigorous joint examination of each step in the design and production process. Um, at, involving all of the participants, um, basically you're asking the question, is every step necessary? Can it be done more cheaply? Um, a lot of times engineers basically start uh, developing something new by copying something that's similar that that was pre-existing. In a lot of cases, the steps from the pre-existing item are then in, inherited into the new item and some of those steps may be completely unnecessary to the production of the new item. So there's a there's a popular Japanese word called uh, kaizen, which is uh, meaning continuous improvement. So ideally, every participant in a supply chain is in the, individually practicing kaizen, and while the supply chain as a whole realizes kaizen. It becomes an everyday, everybody, happening everywhere set of improvements. This is the really the key to supply chain resilience. 
and it's really a measure resilience is really a measure of how well a supply chain can cope and react so another complexity challenging challenge arising from the digitization of the modern automobile is that supply chains are now well they're software laden supply chains in some views the supply chain is a software supply chain and, and some go further by saying that the software supply chain should be managed separately. That, that's a much longer discussion for another time, uh, perhaps. But we can observe that in this, that the software elements in the supply chain are both implicit and explicit. Now, by implicit, I'm referring to the fact that many, in fact, most of the automotive components and subsystems have considerable embedded software assets. In many cases, the functionality and engineering compatibility of these subassemblies in any given model is, is software dependent. So there's a huge premium on the correctness of specifications and requirements so that the suppliers of these components can appropriately configure them and, and they'll work as intended in whatever vehicle they're or whatever application they're utilized. So this is sort of a configure to order process. Also, a high percentage of the software-dependent elements in the finished car are interconnected um, over, a, over the CAN bus. So they have functional safety and hazard analysis and risk assessment considerations. So this is a, this is a huge requirement, specification challenge, as well as a testing challenge and a, and a verification challenge. Um, it's also a compliance obligation. Now, to the extent that any of the testing and functional safety obligation can be delegated to suppliers, that requires considerable uh, or orchestration and coordination and, and data collection for validation purposes. But the OEM still needs to retain the final responsibility for functional safety and compliance. Add to this, there's some very explicit software elements uh, still rightly considered embedded software, but they're, they're consumer visible or, or they're driver facing. So they have user interfaces. And these can be anything from uh, infotainment to instrument clusters to who knows what's coming next. Now, this is a very uh, challenging situation because the, um, the innovation of all of this is, is, needs to be very quick to market. And it can be something that's completely new or something that's newly applied in an automotive setting. And there's, there's multi-mode connectivity, there's, there's interfacing, and all of it's largely driven by consumer preference. So all of this is, particularly the consumer demand part, will mean it's likely to be fulfilled by a very heterogeneous supply chain where the parts involved will change often, they'll have shorter lives, and the supplier mix will, will churn, essentially. And so lastly, there's a category that I'm calling, uh, here I'm calling it VSS. This is really a generic acronym. But what I'm meaning here is the software that is specific to the automotive vertical. It's also usually fulfilled by suppliers. It's things like tooling and assembly robots and CNC equipment and CAD software and warehouse management systems. So there's a vast array of such software that doesn't wind up in the car. But without it, the car doesn't get built. So one of the... One of the things worth mentioning in this in this area is the PLM software. That's the uh, product lifecycle management software. That tends to take the more global view or the holistic view of the entire uh, uh, product delivery or product uh, development process. So um, I'm not going to try to give a tutorial about requirements engineering. Um, yeah, that's a, another very broad subject. I will say there are multitudes of uh, requirements management, requirements engineering uh, practices, and uh, everybody has a, a different view or a different way, a different approach of doing things. I will say they all share some common, common characteristics, common elements, which I've listed here on the on the left hand side. Um, one of the in a supply chain situation, one of the ones that's more interesting is the conveyance. This tends to be something that's unique to a supply chain where you have you have a huge uh, area where 
where requirements need to be conveyed from one supply chain participant to another. This winds up being a, a particular challenging aspect of the, of the supply chain approach. Uh, there's another set of challenges around uh, regulation and compliance. This is a, also another broad subject area, requires a, a lot of time to uh, dissect. I don't have that time today, but for the time being, um, regulation and compliance are really worthy of mention here because of their impact with regard to supply chains. So, as I stated, OEMs really must manage the quality of components received from suppliers. It, because the OEM is basically the, the the one that's liable for any quality or safety failures arising from from the arising from the products. So to this end, OEMs must be able to identify and evaluate whether suppliers meet specific requirements. Suppliers have to provide adequate assurance of quality and performance to the OEMs. And they do this by demonstrating a reliable and comprehensive quality system. So there's a there's really a, a challenge for verification and validation that supplied parts and components meet specifications and fulfill functional safety requirements. To export to export to new markets, OEMs and suppliers must comply with a multitude of legal and technical requirements, and often these are uh, these are mandated by specific countries, specific markets. So. Understanding this wide range of directives and regulations involves, well, it's a significant undertaking, and it's a, it's a real uh, time-to-market challenge. So uh, an approval is a government-issued certificate that allows a product to enter a market. Uh, there's a term to describe how this whole appro approval process works. After getting the approval from the relevant authority, OEMs are responsible for uh, conformity, uh, conformity of production. This requires an ability to accurately and adequately document uh, compliance cases that can survive the scrutiny of uh, some level of regulatory review. So uh, the way forward now is, is quite quite challenging. The supply chain is we've seen is a significant part of the development life cycle. Um, influencing the development life cycles for software as well as for safety life cycles. Th these are all a key determinant of commercial viability. Uh, time to market pressures are going to continue to be driven by very fickle customer likes and dislikes. And at the same time, the consumer expectations of options and variety in, in personalization are going to intensify. And as always, there's going to be just relentless complexity based not only uh, on the sophistication of the underlying vehicle systems and components, but also upon new capabilities in, in new ecosystems. So, uh, you know, someday soon, instead of hunting for a parking spot, uh, when you enter the garage, the garage is going to direct your car to an open parking place and you won't you won't have to imagine the time savings you won't have to be looking hunting around for a parking spot that's just one of many capabilities that are probably going to um be introduced rather rapidly so let's um let me talk a little bit about Polarian Polarian software who we are in this whole big picture uh say Polarian was founded in 2004 S essentially started with a blank piece of paper instead of Integrating point solutions and tools as, as sort of automation islands, Polarian took a really disruptive approach. A year later, Polarian introduced the, the first unified 100% browser-based lifecycle management solution using one repository, one data structure, one set of business logic. Over the last 10 years, we've... Um, We've continued to evolve the solution. We have uh, full traceability, real-time collaboration, uh, an intuitive UI, and we've experienced considerable uh, customer growth, year-over-year -year growth, culminating in the last year of about a 50% growth rate. So to expand on this vision, um, 
recently, Valerian accepted a VC investment from uh, Siemens Corporation. This is going to help us continue to build out the company in, in our solutions in support of a enterprise, a worldwide enterprise customer base. We're already pretty well established. The numbers really speak for themselves. There's over 250 deployments, at least two and a half million current users, some 200 plus extensions and connectors that allow for integrations with uh, complementary tools and solutions and technologies. It's a vibrant ecosystem. There's a there's also a vibrant user community of at least 15,000 uh, community members. There's a really a testament to the Polarian vision is the um, is the adoption in sectors that are really standards driven and are safety critical or they're compliance intensive. So at the same time, all of these customers receive huge uh, return on investment improvements. So uh, typical user stories or user cases say that you know. Prior to Polarian adoption, they used to spend a quarter of their time just managing, you know, the, the environment, managing traceability. With the Polarian uh, adoption, they, they shrink that down to 5%, 10%. So this really has translated into about an 80% time savings. There's some typical logo screen, customer logo screen, but actually the best part about working at Polarian is that, I, you know, on a daily basis, we get to see what really, you know, many, many talented people in, in hundreds of companies are able to accomplish with Polarian. So it's really the more gratifying aspect of the job is just to be able to see what, what you all are doing with, uh, with the tool set. And uh, obviously, this is going to get more exciting, particularly in automotive, but in all areas, uh, transportation, medical devices, consumer electronics, literally planes, trains, and automobiles, the, the so-called emerging Internet of, uh, Internet of Things. So this is the real power of Polarian. Okay, so um, let's look now at some of the, I can only highlight a few, but let's look at some of the features and attributes um, that are of interest in the context of a supply chain, some of the, the product features in the Polarian solution. So... One of the things I'll, I'll make a point about first is the, the supply chain is obviously integral to the success of the automotive uh, manufacturer of the automotive sector. And uh, we're a vendor of, of ALM, of application lifecycle management products. So something to remember is that all of the management issues associated with a supply chain can be framed in the context of a life cycle. So collaboration with suppliers in the chain Collaboration with them as innovation partners means uh, functional unification. So all of the requisite aspects and areas and roles and standards and conditions and obligations, all of that needs to be managed for the entire chain as a complex organization by itself. So there's really a development life cycle to the supply chain. Uh, the supply chain essentially is engaged in the development of a complex finished product. One of the fundamental things making it possible for a globally spread supply chain to collaborate is the ability to interact. And so Polarian leverages, the, leverages and exploits the, the modern uh, capabilities of um, being a web-based browser-centric user interface. So there's no constraints to access, really allows for access from anywhere the internet is available from any platform using any browser. This is, this is bolstered by user interfaces and functionality that are, that are both intuitive and familiar. So Polarian provides uh, facilities and functions all of the things that are needed, like uh, requirements management, quality ma quality assurance, and risk management, and testing, all of that's presented in a manner that's very compelling and meaningful to users, and and can be customized and extended however however needed. So for supply chain participants as well as for the supply chain as a whole, it becomes sort of a unifying repository of artifacts and work items that really facilitate collaboration. 
And, and of course, there's a capability to tailor views into this life cycle management environment based upon the individual roles and functions of the relevant stakeholders, as well as an, an appropriate context. So, for example, certain participants may not need to access, they may not need to access to certain artifacts or capabilities uh, until their functional role dictates that need. So that all can be uh, established and configured and managed within, within Polarian. Uh, as I mentioned, um, risk assessment comes in different flavors depending upon context and area, as well as requirements. So what, all I really wanted to make a point here about is to say one of the one of the areas of requirements that we highlighted as being somewhat interesting or difficult in a supply chain context is the the ability to convey requirements. So uh, Polarian has some very uh, robust capability that allow for either a, a document-centric exchange of requirements through some very uh, robust um, industry-leading capability to uh, essentially accomplish a round trip where a, a Microsoft, familiar Microsoft Word or Excel document can be taken, can be started in the Polarian environment, taken outside of the Polarian environment, changed, brought back in, and to have all of that be reflected in the in the Polarian uh, in the in the, the Polarian um, lifecycle management environment. There's also situations where a more data centric approach uh, is is adopted for the conveyance of requirements. Um, so here there's a in, there's built in capability to uh, exchange uh, information exchange requirements through the uh, the REC IF uh, format. All of these, basically, all of these artifacts uh, are bidirectionally linked, allowing for impact analysis, automatic change control, all of the things necessary for, in this case, uh, supply chain risk management. So you have intense traceability throughout the entire supply chain. The last thing I'll mention here is Polarian is uh, qualified as a as a trusted tool in the context of uh, functional safety. Polarian also provides some very very um, compelling collaborative features. So things like wiki pages, live documents. These are special documents that uh, contain both free form and granular work items. You can have live pages information that does not need to be tracked uh, and workflow managed through a process as work items, uh, as well as live pages that have all the features of info pages, plus they include a catalog of widgets uh, to visually build robust reports and retrieve that retrieve information and aggregate information. There's, um, there's also a, uh, a Polarian SDK that documents the uh, robust set of APIs um, and it allows for access to all of the all of the data there's there's source code there's libraries there's code examples for anybody who really wants to extend uh, Polarian some other key capabilities are uh, related to workflow and approvals there's a capability to automate the workflow customize customize the automated workflow essentially they're provide a life cycle within a life cycle. So for the artifacts and work items, these need to be linked together. That provides the traceability between them as well as they, they have a workflow to drive their intended use and their, that workflow is contextually based. So there's a contextual basis for distribution or socialization among the relevant participants. So this allows for some um, approval hierarchies that the workflows can establish capabilities to orchestrate the review and approval chain so that processes are appropriately governed and oversight can be enforced and, and proven. So one of the things, one of the things uh, would be oversight of the workflow itself. If we all agree by consensus that we're going to change the workflow, we need to evidence that that, that agreement. Um, the approval chain can be can be enabled and facilitated through certified e-signatures. Now, these are binding electronic equivalents to handwritten signatures. Um, 
as established by um, US FDA to ensure there's a clear accountability and irrefutable record. So these are just some of the highlighted features. Um, at this point, it's customary to give some sort of a demo. So uh, I was thinking about doing something a little bit more interesting than just having me give you a real quick guided tour of the Polarian UI and basic features. Actually, we make it very easy for, for you to discover all of that yourselves on your own by visiting polarian.com. You can either download a single user version, you can install locally and, and play around with it, or if you don't want to mess with installing anything, uh, there is a test drive that's available. But uh, essentially, you can experience all of your own PLM demo in the cloud. So I encourage you all, all of you to check out ALM for yourselves. What I thought might be more interesting considering our topic would be to demo an integration between Polarian ALM and a PLM environment, um, specifically the Siemens Team Center environment. Remember I talked about the, the sort of synergistic productivity boost in a supply chain by leveraging uh, an integration opportunity between an ALM system and a PLM system. You remember that slide with all of the cascading information flows. So one huge gain is the integration between PLM and ALM. So I've asked one of my um, my fellow product managers here at Polarian, uh, Clara Chismaru, who's actually, she's based in Europe, and her area of responsibility involves uh, Polarian integrations, um, which she'll, she was directly involved in the integration between ALM and PLM. So I've asked her to give us a really brief a peek into what that may look like um, in the context of a supply chain. So I'll turn it over to Clara. Hello, everybody. Oh, good morning, good, good afternoon. Uh, as Michael told you, I am uh, responsible here for, for integrating this application. Actually, he was talking earlier about challenging in requirement integration. He was talking earlier about the necessity of collaborating. And uh, uh, my role here is to help you achieve this and overcome these challenges. And I have a very short demo today about our brand new product uh, that uh, connects uh, Siemens Team Center, uh, Siemens PLM, with Polarion ALM. Uh, we have a lot of customers that told us that one of their ma major challenges is the fact that uh, when they, they collaborate with suppliers, they uh, manage requirements with uh, documents, with uh, emails, so it's really, really difficult to, to keep track of them, to make sure whether the requirements were implemented correctly whether, and whether the product was working the way it was requested. I have an example here on our uh, LMPLM integration uh, from uh, with a car. I, I will not mention now the, the brand is definitely not a Volkswagen. So we have this active grill shutter uh, that, that is installed on the machine to improve the fuel economy. And this component has software component that controls how, how this uh, grill shutter works uh, in accordance to different parameters. Actually, uh, before this is uh, created, so when the requirement is formulated at the product level, we want to see what does it mean at the software level. So we want to be able to evaluate it. And how do we do this? Our goal is to connect the product requirements that are managed in, in Team Center with the uh, software requirements that are managed in Polarion. And you see here we have a diagram where uh, our intention is to connect uh, uh, one major requirement with uh, one uh, requirement, one software requirement, and then through this bidirectional referencing, we uh, are able later to to um, navigate to the full traceability tree to see all the derived requirements from the software. We can go to the software model, we can look to testing, uh, even to, to the source code, and the other way around from Polarium. So let's see how this actually uh, works. So we will start from, uh, from Team Center. So this is the, the user interface from Team Center. 
we have this control airflow requirement that has a, a lot of children, and we use a workflow function that delegates these requirements to the software domain. So you saw it was just one click. Now uh, we can see here the analysis task that we created in, in Palladium. Now the next step we want to go to, we will see in Palladium how uh, the people here are alerted that we have uh, analysis task created for them. So this is a task that was created automatically and this is the, the team center interface where you can actually see uh, the content of the uh, original uh, product requirement and from here you see here in this, this navigation tree you can see uh, the children requirements. Now you have to understand that this is actually an example workflow. This workflow is absolutely, is completely customizable so you can actually uh, define whether, you know, when, when a product requirement is created, whether you want to have an analysis task or whether you want to have a different type of work item. So you, you, after, after you look at the details, in our example we assumed that for the sake of the simplicity here that the requirement was understood and then, then the people in the software, they are able now to elicitate, to further elicitate this, this requirement so that they can define how the software component can work. So we marked the task in the progress, we changed the, the comment, and now we will go back to Team Center where well, we'd like to show you how the status, you see there's a refresh here, and now the status is automatically changed to in progress. So practically the, the change in the workflow, it, it is automatically propagated in Team Center. Now we will go back to Polarion and we are ready now to elaborate the software requirements. So we, we return to our Actually, when, when we created the analysis task, now uh, we, we also created a placeholder for the requirements that we want to uh, elicitate. So we use a parent requirement that is the main link between the software and the product requirement. And now we are using the, the live document to see, to elicitate this, this requirement. So I'm, I'm, I'm not adding here too much content again for the simplicity of the of the demo. I, I'm adding two children requirements to, to the original requirement. And then uh, as soon as we save this document, practically these two child requirements were added to, to the original software requirement. And we can also mark the analyzer task to, to done because this means that we, we finished what, what we intended initially. So now it's time to go back to Team Center and see if the last step of our demo where you can see that the status of the task is done and we can uh, navigate to the full traceability tree where from Team Center, so we, you see now the user interface of Team Center, is the original product requirement. You will see how we go to this relation browser where uh, here we have a tree view with all the uh, requirements that were created and the analysis stuff that were created. And you see here in this part of the screen, in this viewer, this is exactly the user interface of Polarium. I've hidden here the navigation tree because there wasn't much space on the screen, but actually from here you, you are able to navigate to different parts of Polarion. It depends on the user rights that, that you actually have here. So you see now I'm, I'm, I can easily go to, to the requirements that we created from this main requirement. So this is actually... I would like to, to stop the demo here because there are many, many things to show and I think uh, I encourage you to go to our website to the LMPLM page and find more about this uh, integration. As a conclusion, what I, what I would like you to remember is that here we are trying in Polarion to help you uh, improve the communication with your partners because we found out that many times uh, uh, you are using similar tools or if you are using different tools, uh, chances are that we already have uh, an integration with, with uh, this product. So it will be easier for you to work 
if you connect them automatically, then if you work with uh, emails or exchanges of, of different documents. Thank you very much, Clara. And I do have one question I wanted to ask to Mike here. And the question I have is, where do navigation suppliers fall on the list of suppliers? Are they strategic? I assume we're talking about something like GPS navigation. So that, that's somewhat contextually driven. Arguably, that's a, it's a situation of, a, of emerging technological capabilities, new, new innovations. So I would probably list that as a strategic partner. Um, obviously, when you start getting into the area of uh, connected vehicles or even autonomous self-driving vehicles, obviously that makes it a hugely strategic partnership. So that would be that would be probably my characterization of the of that supply chain relationship okay thank you very much mike and we do have a few other questions but um in the interest of time i would like to go ahead and conclude today's webinar so again thank you for spending some time with us today bye